Well, welcome to the Off Central Podcast. My name is Jonathan Prothero and uh, yeah, riding solo again today. Looking forward to jumping in, diving straight in. I want to give you something that I think will challenge you in your thinking, but ultimately will help grow. We all want to grow, right? We want to grow in our relationship with God. We want to grow in our faith. Uh, Hopefully we want to grow. And if you don't, I hope this gives you some incentive to grow. But I'm assuming if you sat down and you're watching this or listening to this, that that you do want to be challenged to maybe think differently or approach scripture differently in a new way uh, and to be encouraged as well. So I hope that does that for you today. So here's what I was thinking. Last time, uh, I gave you a couple quick biblical tools. Uh, Whenever you open the Bible, it can be challenging at times times, not at time, at times. It can be quite difficult to sort of open it up and just dive straight in if you don't know what you're doing. Uh, Like anything, you know, if you don't know how to swim, you can be in water and you can splash around and and maybe you can float for a bit, but but really finding some efficiency and joy in swimming takes time to develop those techniques. And, uh, And I think that's what it's like when wading through scripture a little bit. And so I gave you a few biblical tools and, and if not, you can go back if you haven't seen that. You can go back and watch that and, uh, and I hope that's helpful for you. Today, what I wanted to do is I want to talk about interpretation of scripture. And it's a very loaded term. Sometimes people roll their eyes a little bit when we talk about interpretation of scripture. And I think one of the critiques that's often thrown at me is, oh mate, you don't interpret scripture, you just read it and you do it. Or, or scripture is, is a rule book, or scripture is clear on these issues and this issue, and uh, it's not a case of interpreting and finding your way through it, uh, you just have to follow what it says. And, and I agree with that in part, but also highly disagree with that in part as well. Uh, sometimes scripture is really clear on some issues, and it seems pretty black and white. But in my experience and my growth of Christianity, even in approaching Scripture that way, things that often appear to be very clear, um, the longer I've walked it out and the more I've learned about Scripture, I've realized that they're actually not that clear. There's a lot of stuff bubbling beneath the surface going on. There's the writer's intentions, there's uh, you know, the speaker's intention, there's all these cultural contexts that you have to read in and you have to kind of wade your way through. And so I do understand the sentiment that not all of scripture has to be interpreted, but I would also argue that everything you read is at some level interpreted. Every word I say, your brain is doing an interpretation of that word, and everybody has a slightly different understanding of what a word can mean. So, for example, if I say the word love, we all sort of roughly understand and and are congruent and agree with what love means, but everybody will have their own version of what love really is and what it looks like and how that functions in their life, depending on your knowledge and what you've read and your experiences of life. All of that feeds into interpreting. When I say the word love, what is it you think of? For some of you, maybe you've just gone through a divorce or, or you've broken up with your boyfriend, girlfriend. And so love right now is synonymous with pain or infatuation or passion or uh, things not quite working out. For, for others who have been married for 70 years, your love and your interpretation of love will look vastly different to a 13-year-old's interpretation of love who have just read Romeo and Juliet and it's all flowers and stars and moonlight and passion. Uh, Somebody who's been married for 70 years will consider it something quite different. It's about being patient. It's about sacrifice. It's about uh, uh, steadfastness. It's about letting your yes be yes and your no be no. So anyway, my point in that is that whenever we pick up Scripture, we're doing some form of interpretive work. Whether you like it or not, whether you're aware of it or whether you're unaware of it, everything is filtered through a lens. I'm hitting my own headphones here. Everything is filtered through a lens and that lens is you. That lens is your life, your experiences, your understanding, your knowledge, your wisdom. Everything that makes up you is a lens that you filter information through. And so when it comes to scripture, we are doing interpretation. We are doing interpretive work. Now, what's partly the issue with that? One of the issues with interpretate, interp- interpreting, interpreting, interpreting is what I was about to say, interpreting scripture is that 
you don't want to interpret it or get to a stage where everyone has their own version of what the Bible is and what it means to them. In other words, we can get to a point where interpretation goes so far that we just have this subjectivist uh, uh, understanding of how Scripture works for me, but it might work different for you, rather than an objective understanding around key issues and what Scripture was meant to mean. And here's the thing. Although we're always doing interpretive work because we're filtering it through a lens, we're always trying to get at this objective understanding of what scripture is. And uh, and that was an issue right up uh, until Jesus' day and obviously right up until today. And here's one of the things that I think is really helpful for you when you're reading scripture is to understand that, that Jesus in many ways solves this problem. In fact, not in many ways, in all the ways, he solves this issue of Uh, How do we interpret scripture, but not in such a way that it just becomes so subjective that it's like it's it's too ephemeral. It's not like it's like where where is the groundedness of objectivity that we need from scripture? But at the same time, I don't want to become so locked in my understanding of scripture that I think that my way of understanding scripture is objective all of the time. I hope that made sense. So here's one of the issues with interpreting scripture is something that can seem really clear is actually really complex. This was an issue for the Israelites all the way uh, throughout Scripture. You take a simple Scripture like in Leviticus 11, there's very strict laws around eating pork. And, And you would think, okay, well, there's not much interpretive work that goes on there, right? It just says, don't eat pork. So, So what is it and how am I meant to follow that? Well, I follow that by not eating pork. Pretty straightforward, right? It's not complicated. doesn't seem to be nuanced. There doesn't seem to be gray areas around that. Well, you would think, because what happened was people would read that and then they would ask questions, well, what technically constitutes as pork? Is it only the meat from the pig or is it the fat as well? Is it the skin? Or what about if the pork had been raised and reared around other cattle and and the sheep, for example, or our cows had been in proximity to the pig, but we don't eat the pig, but we eat the cow that had been in proximity and raised with our pigs. Are they somehow contaminated as well? Or do we have to separate those things out? Or or what what if I didn't intentionally eat pork? Like I was eating a meal at a friend's house and I was just eating it. And then I ask, wow, this is delicious. What's in this meal? And they go, oh, well, it's, it's my favorite dish. It's pork. Oh my gosh, I'm eating pork. I'm breaking the law. Uh, uh, but am I breaking the law if I didn't know that I was breaking the law? And is there the same punishment for somebody who didn't know versus somebody who knew it and still broke it anyway? Well, what if you were starving and you had no other option and pork just happened to be the only option? So either death on one hand or I could eat this pork that somebody is offering me. Do I still have to follow that scripture? Does it mean that much? Is it that weighty that I cannot eat it, that I have to choose death and abandoning my children and abandoning my wife and my responsibilities just to uphold this piece of scripture? Or is there allowances. Am I, I'm not allowed to eat pork, but am I allowed to drink pork? I'm not allowed to eat pork, but am I allowed to taste pork on my tongue and then spit it out, right? So, okay, it's all a bit silly, but the point is sometimes what seems very simple and clear cut, like this is just the objective truth, don't eat pork, became really, really complicated really, really quickly. And so what you would have is all these interpretations of scripture by different rabbis that would come out. What would a rabbi do? They would read scripture and then they would interpret scripture. And rabbis would have disciples. They would have followers. And if you were a follower of a rabbi, you had to learn the rabbi's way of walking out scripture. You had to learn the rabbi's way of interpreting scripture and applying it to your life. This was the same with Sabbath, you know, take a rest day. 
Well, then people ask, well, what constitutes as rest? Rest for me looks different from rest for you. And am I allowed to rescue my donkey if it falls into a ditch because it's worth a lot of money to our family? Or do I have to rescue that out? Am I allowed to rescue that out? Or is that considered work? Uh, and if I stand up from the couch, is that considered work? If I cook for the family because they need food, or do I have to prep it in a day beforehand? Is that considered work or is that just considered family time together? So there were all these tiny little nuances to every single law in Scripture, and there were all these interpretations, and rabbis would have different ways of looking, and they argued backwards and forwards. Now, these are little things, right? Poor core. Uh, uh, taking a rest eye. I mean, day. I mean, I say they're little, but but then there were really difficult ones, like around divorce, uh, and there's only a few scriptures that pertain to that, and so they were trying to figure out, well, what are grounds for divorce? And rabbis would have very heated debates, and and people would be on different sides of the aisle about how does this work out, and so the difficulty is always finding. On the subjectivist, objectivist continuum, on that spectrum, how do I make sure that I'm not just all the way to this extreme of the objective, but not all the way to this extreme of subjective as well, but I find like a healthy balance where I understand that this is the truth of Scripture, but I also understand how this applies to me personally. This changes my life. Now, the cool thing about Jesus is Jesus comes onto the scene. And if you were a rabbi, you, there were basically two types of rabbis, right? Now, remember, rabbis were the best of 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 the best, right? Uh, every American kid wants to grow up playing, I don't know, uh, football for, I was going to say the Patriots, but that's the wrong city for the Ravens. <laughs> uh, maybe you're a kid and you grow up wanting to play for the Ravens uh, and, and you want to be that star quarterback. Well, well, that's cool, but how many people get to be the star quarterback for the Ravens? one person, right? Maybe two. And what happens to the rest of the 99.99999% of them? They don't make it. They don't make the cut. At some point, they're told, you do not qualify. You are not good enough. You do not make the cut. And so when it comes to rabbis, these were the best of the best. These were the quarterbacks. These were the guys that made it. Everybody else was told, you do not have what it takes. Go home, work your father's business, work your family's business. Thank you very much. That's a very shortened version of that. We can do a longer teaching on how they became rabbis at some point. But the point is this. The rabbis were right at the top. It was every Israelite's schoolboy dream to become a rabbi, but very few made it. And there were two types of rabbis. You had a rabbi without authority, and you had rabbis with authority. Now, rabbis without authority, what did that mean? That simply meant that you had to teach the same interpretation from the rabbi that you learned from. So whoever you followed, whoever you were discipled underneath, you would walk, you would follow everything about that rabbi's life. And then if you, uh, on graduation day, when you turned 30 and you became a rabbi, if you had no authority, you had to teach the same, what was called yoke, the same weight, the same interpretation that your rabbi taught you. And that, again, of all rabbis, that was 99% of all rabbis. But every once in a while, maybe every two or three generations, a rabbi would come along and that rabbi would have what's called samika. Samika. Uh, that rabbi would have authority. And a rabbi with authority simply meant that you got to teach something other than the yoke, than the interpretation that was passed on to you. And how did you become a rabbi with Samika, a rabbi with authority? Well, on your graduation day, you had to have two people of authority witness and testify to it. Uh, because every rabbi got baptized on graduation day, and you'd have to have two witnesses on your baptism day. And so Jesus, at the age of 30, he goes where? Think about your Bible. He goes to John the Baptist. He goes on his graduation day to get baptized. And here's John saying, wow, here's the, here's the son of God, you know, whose sandals I'm not worthy to take off his feet. You know, behold, uh, is the Lamb of God. And he's making all these declarations. There's this, there's this witness that is there who is testifying to the authority of Jesus. But that's only one. And so Jesus comes under and he comes up and there's no other voice until finally a second voice speaks up and says, behold, my son, in who I am well pleased. And the skies open and there's lightning and rainbows and doves and all this sort of stuff. But, but it's as though God is saying, 
wow, if nobody else will speak up for my son, I will do it. I will be the second witness to give him authority to speak, to give us a new interpretation of scripture, to give us a new yoke, a new way of doing life. Think about the teachings of Jesus. You have heard it said, but I tell you. In other words, you have heard the other rabbis teach it this way, but I want to give you a new way of doing this. Jesus says, come follow me for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In other words, my way of doing life, it's not hard. It's not weighty. It's not difficult. And I think when we're looking to interpret scripture, we have to do it. Please catch this. If you switch off the podcast or you're driving or something busy is happening, lock into this next sentence. You have to do it through the lens of Jesus Christ. You have to do it through his interpretive lens. If you find scripture confusing and difficult, my recommendation is start with Jesus. And if you understand his way of reading scripture, that gives you a whole platform, that gives you a foundation with which to go back and read the rest of scripture through the lens and the compassion and the love and the fulfillment that Jesus brings to scripture. And here's a quick question to finish off with. How many of you have been given authority in Samika to reinterpret scripture? I'm going to answer that question for you. None of you have. I haven't been given that authority. Pastor Larry hasn't been given that authority. Pastor Terry hasn't been given that authority, nor any man after Jesus. It was Jesus who had authority to take Scripture and to, to bring it to light, to fulfill it in the way that he'd always designed it to do. Jesus says, I haven't come to do away with the law. I've come to fulfill the law. I've come to give you a new yoke. I've come to show you what all the scripture was always pointing towards. I'm going to show you what's called the way. Before we had the name Christian or Christians, like we're Christians, we were called the way. Uh, and I love that phrasing because we are called to follow in Jesus's way. And so Jesus has authority. Remember when they say to him, you do not teach like the other rabbis do. You teach as one who has authority. That, that doesn't just mean somebody who's standing on the corners of the street yelling really loud with authority. They're talking about he has a different way of teaching and unpacking and looking at scripture. And so I hope that inspires you if you're struggling with some part of scripture to go and to start with the words of Jesus Christ, the words of our savior, the words of the rabbi who had authority. And I hope that was insightful for you today. I hope that encouraged you today. Read the red letters of Jesus. I've been going through the book of Matthew again and it's so brilliant when you sit there and you read the Sermon on the Mount. And when you think about it, how did Jesus get all of these people? He's just started his ministry, right? He's 30 years old. Nobody knows who he is. Well, if the crowds heard that there was a new rabbi, this was a once in every two, three generation, a rabbi with authority, with Samika was on the scene, and he was about to teach this new yoke that was easy and was light, people turned up by the droves to hear the, this new interpretation of Scripture. And so, yes, we're always doing interpretive work. We're always reading it through our lens. But let's try and have in our eyes and in our mind's eye and our heart and our soul the lens that Jesus Christ has put onto us. That's what it means to be a Christian, to follow in his way, to follow in his footsteps, to be covered in his dust, as it were. I'm going to finish there, otherwise I could preach for the next 20 minutes. But I hope that somehow encouraged you. I hope it challenged you. And God bless. We'll chat to you soon. Next week, Pastor Larry will be back. And uh, we're looking forward to having a good time. God bless.